On World News Tonight, historic floods. Thousands rendered helpless as China faces the worst flooding in a millennium. Rising tolls. Global estimates come under uncertainty as India reveals excess debt tallies. Counting down. The world prepares for yet another season of the Olympics despite pandemic concerns. A space trip. Jeff Bezos successfully returns to home base after a journey that was out of this world. From the global resources of the Verona Media Network, this is Other Verona World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Danidu Vitanawasam. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the devastation in China. Thousands of people were forced to evacuate with multiple people feared dead as record-breaking rainfall caused massive floods throughout the nation. It's been hammering down since the weekend and the forecast still looks bleak for China's Henan province. An unusual rainy season has turned roads into murky rivers and rivers into brimming torrents. Across the region, soldiers, police officers and firefighters have been pushing stranded vehicles, manning rescue rafts and helping trapped residents out of their flooded homes and to the safety of drier land. The heaviest downpour has been in Pingding Shan City, where over 40 centimetres of rain was recorded. But it was in the provincial capital where the rains and the flooding turned deadly, as the water inundated subway stations and underground train carriages, leaving passengers deep in water. According to authorities, the rainfall in the city has been the heaviest since records began 60 years ago. Regional weather bureaus have now issued the highest warning level, with the deluge set to last until at least Wednesday night. Over in America, US President Joe Biden marks six months in office and insists on keeping his promise on the COVID-19 crisis and the economy. But from rising prices to rising crime, Republicans are lashing out against the Biden administration. A six-month milestone. <laughs> Today, for the first time, President Biden convened his team without distancing, elbow to elbow, in the cabinet room. We're delivering on our promises. His stewardship over the COVID crisis, the highest priority. We have to stay vigilant, especially with the Delta variant that's out there. The president did deliver on his early pledge to speed vaccinations, but now struggles to convince hesitant Americans to get the shots. On the economy, he says now more Americans are working. Three million jobs, more than any administration has done in the first six months of being in office. But today, House Republicans delivered their own six-month report card, including blasting inflation at a 13-year high. Americans are paying more for everything thanks to President Joe Biden. On the global stage, the president says he has restored traditional partnerships. America is back at the table. But it's unclear whether demands made of adversaries like Russia will be met. And on immigration, Republicans blame the president for migrant apprehensions at a 21-year high. At the border, the crisis continues to spiral out of control. We've seen historic numbers continue to rise. The president unsatisfied. We have to tackle uh, uh, the immigration problem, which we're working really hard to get done. Over to France now, the cell phone of French President Emmanuel Macron and 15 members of the French government may have been among potential targets in 2019 of surveillance by spyware made by the Israeli-based NSO group. The latest victims revealed in this far-reaching spy scandal are at the top of the French government. According to the investigation by non-profit journalism group Forbidden Stories into the use of Pegasus spyware, a phone belonging to President Emmanuel Macron has been regularly targeted by the Moroccan Secret Service since 2017. Former Prime Minister Edouard Philippe was also earmarked for surveillance, along with 14 other ministers. Close advisors to the president, lawmakers and political personalities were also affected. Their numbers appeared on a list of targets of the Pegasus spyware software. 
It can be used to read messages, look at photos and videos, access contacts and calendar data, and track location using GPS. But their phones would have to be analysed in order to be certain of how successful the operation was. Former minister Francois de Rougy has allowed his device to be looked at. And it's been confirmed there were three attempts to access it in 2019. The Elysee has said that it's taking the allegations extremely seriously and plans to investigate further. Meanwhile, the Moroccan authorities have denied any knowledge of the spyware. Over in Germany, devastating flooding in western part of the country has killed at least 171 people. Meanwhile, Germany's government has hit back at criticism over its warning system. Let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Inuka Aponsu, joining us now from Cleve in Germany. Yes, Danidu. In Rhineland, Palatinat, to Zawaila, the region hardest hit by the fatal floods, death has mounted to 122. More than 763 people have been injured, while a further 155 people are still missing or remain unreachable. Meanwhile, the flood battered north is also facing a dire situation, with 48 people dead so far, while Bavaria lost at least one person to the catastrophe. With the flood now ebbing and rebuilding underway, many people fear that the dead toll is likely to continue climbing. The government has hit back at criticism over its warning systems after the worst flooding in decades. The opposition Green Party said the disaster showed Germany must prepare better for extreme weather events. Flood warning systems sent out alerts a few days before the heavy rain. However, they failed to reach many residents or officials in time. Back to you, Danidu. Thank you. That was Adh a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Aponsu reporting from Cleve in Germany. On to the crisis in Haiti now as the country's new Prime Minister, Oriol Andre, took office in the aftermath of the president's assassination two weeks ago, pledging to improve the country's dire security and organize long-delayed elections. Haiti swore in its new Prime Minister, Ariel Henry, on Tuesday, nearly two weeks after the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse. Moïse's assassination sparked further political turmoil for the impoverished nation, which has grappled with a surge in gang violence and a growing humanitarian crisis. Henri vowed on Tuesday to bring Moïse's killers to justice and said it was time for the country to come together. We will create a secure, reliable and stable environment to facilitate political activities throughout the country. We will expect massive participation in the next presidential elections, the highest participation of citizens of voting age. Henri's swearing-in took place as official memorial services began for Moïse, who was killed on July 7th by a group of over 20 mostly Colombian mercenaries. The leader's own security chief, some Haitian police officers, and a couple of Haitian Americans were also suspected of being involved and taken into custody. Henri, a 71-year-old neurosurgeon, was tapped by Moïse to be the new prime minister just days before he was assassinated, but had not yet been sworn in. Tuesday's ceremony appears to end a power struggle between Henri and outgoing Prime Minister Claude Joseph, who held on to the post after Moise's murder, despite political opposition. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. A new study shows that India's excess deaths during the COVID-19 pandemic could be as high as 4.9 million, providing further evidence that millions more have died from coronavirus than the official tally. A study by a Washington think tank is providing the latest evidence that India's coronavirus death toll could be millions higher than the official government tally. The NGO, called the Center for Global Development, says India has experienced 4.9 million excess deaths since the start of the pandemic through June this year. That means 4.9 million more people have died than would normally occur during that time period from natural causes, accidents, and other regular non-COVID-related issues. For reference, India's official COVID tally is 414,000 dead, the third highest in the world behind Brazil at 542,000 and the United States with 608,000. Not all of the excess deaths would be COVID, but some experts believe that counting excess deaths is the most accurate way to measure the pandemic's devastation. 
Health experts say undercounting in India would be largely due to scarce resources in rural areas, which are home to two-thirds of the country's population of nearly 1.4 billion people, and also that many deaths at home aren't tested. India's government has previously dismissed reports that the death toll could be much higher, and most cities in India have lifted their strict lockdowns. There are concerns by authorities, though, that mass gatherings such as religious festivals are still acting as super-spreader events. On Tuesday, a separate study by the Indian government stated that two-thirds of the Indian population are believed to have coronavirus antibodies, meaning they've come into contact with the disease. Let's move on to the updates on the Tokyo Olympics. The dream has come true. With just two days left to go to the official commencement of the Tokyo Games, athletes in the Olympic Village prepare for the final stretch, with some games already having begun despite pandemic concerns. To give us an update on this, we have Other Than the World News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandra Dasa joining us now from Tokyo in Japan. Rasita? Well, while we still have two more days for the official Olympic start, some of the games have already started in Tokyo and surrounding area. Today in Fukushima, the Japanese softball team defeated Australian team 8-1. Softball and baseball are making a comeback to the Olympics after the peak in 2008. And those two games are immensely popular in Japan and the local teams are expected to do very well. In the COVID front, there were some press releases yesterday said the count of the in total infected athletes and the official are around 67. And we had few more cases today and the total count is nearly hitting 80. And some of the teams, some of the countries has been specially affected by the recent positive cases one, one such a country is South Africa. Both South African football team and the rugby union team had few positive cases, including their coaches. To make matters worse, according to the Olympic rules, not just those who tested positive for the COVID, even the close contacts has to be self-isolated for a few days. So that has put immense stress on the both uh, football and the uh, uh, rugby union team uh, of the South Africans. And the IOC president, Thomas Bach, he gave his first, uh, first press conference, open press conferences last week, where he reiterated an Olympic with a safe and secured Olympic. In fact, Tokyo 2020 Olympics has everyone, uh, even in press conference, athletes and the organizing committees is putting safety and security over the uh, whatever the Olympic mottos they had before. So we are all set for the Olympic start on Friday and pretty much every single athlete have arrived in Japan. And some of the athletes, like the American gymnastics team, as uh, preferring to stay outside of the Olympic village due to the COVID restriction rules. Uh, see you on Friday in front of the Olympic village. Over to you. We are also looking forward to the awaited opening on Friday. Thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandra Dasa reporting from Tokyo in Japan. Crossing back to the United States, the Delta variant of the coronavirus is the cause of more than 80% of new COVID-19 cases. Hospitals across the United States are seeing a surge in COVID cases fueled by the Delta variant. This comes as the country is already averaging 26,000 new infections a day. Tonight, inside a growing number of hospitals across the country, there is little doubt our nation has already entered a fourth wave, an explosive summer surge in COVID cases few predicted. Fueled by the highly contagious Delta variant, now accounting for 83% of all new cases, the U.S. is already averaging 26,000 new infections a day, over 1,000 an hour. Today on Capitol Hill, the nation's top pandemic doctors said it's the unvaccinated accelerating the pandemic as deaths skyrocket by nearly 50 percent. With the highest infection rates in the nation, states like Missouri, Arkansas and Florida have vaccination centers that are empty and hospital beds that are full. 
At the University of Alabama, Birmingham, the pediatric care unit was nearly forced to shut down after a flood of children suffering from respiratory viruses that usually spike and spread in the winter. Cases of RSV are surging as restrictions loosen and more children gather together, the same way COVID can. Now fearing a widespread fall surge, even vaccines are no guarantee against Delta's serious threat. Today we learned a fully vaccinated White House staffer and an aide to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi also tested positive for the virus after meeting with fully inoculated Democratic Texas lawmakers who flew maskless to Washington and suffered breakthrough infections. Tonight, an evolving threat as the unvaccinated face a future that looked more like our past. We have some good news for you. Brazil has started a new initiative to start increasing the access to COVID-19 vaccines by traveling in a bus that improves as the mobile vaccination center. The vaccination bus is a joint initiative of the Brazilian Red Cross, the Department of Health and the government of Minas Gerais. And the vehicle was donated by Mercedes-Benz. The mobile vaccination unit, which looks similar to the buses used for public transportation, will distribute jabs throughout the state for a total of 45 days, bringing increased immunization to the municipalities. There are three immunization cabins with the vaccination bus, and its crew consists of six people who are aided by local teams. Experts say that the bus could stop at community centers and housing complexes while operating near other services like food distribution programs. The region says more drive through clinics will be held in the area this week after the success it had had during the first event. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Wildfires raging across the western United States and Canada, including a two-week-old blaze in Oregon. Belt storm and soot that gusted eastwards and caused harmful air pollution as far away as New York City. Lawmakers in South Korea are trying to prevent global tech giant Google's in-app billing system from holding a monopoly over in-app purchases. They want to allow app developers to be able to offer their customers a range of payment methods. Turkish authorities announced a partial reopening of an abandoned town, potential resettlement drawing a strong rebuke from rival Greek Cypriots of orchestrating a land grab by stealth. Thousands of people took to the streets of Bogota, Colombia's capital, in an attempt to revive the anti-government protest to scupper President Ivan Dicu's controversial proposed tax reforms. And finally tonight, a man who knows the heights of success went even higher. Jeff Bezos, billionaire and founder of Amazon, got the ride of his life rocketing into space with three others, which was a key moment for fledging industry seeking to make the final frontier accessible to elite tourists. Roaring off the launch pad in remote West Texas, Jeff Bezos' billionaire space dreams came true today. As he, brother Mark, Dutch teenager Oliver Damon, and 82-year-old Wally Funk, I love it. Blue Origin's first passengers floated weightless 66 miles up. Oh, is it everything you thought fantastic. it would be? After four minutes, a dramatic parachute plunge to Earth. Their 10 and a half minute trip coming to a soft landing in the desert sand. And touchdown. <laughs> Twenty-one years after founding Blue Origin as an all-purpose space company, Bezos and his fellow passengers earned their astronaut wings today. There are a few people I know more deserving of this, Jeff. For Wally Funk, who NASA never allowed to fly because of her gender, a celebration 60 years in the making. And I want to thank you, sweetheart, because you made it possible for me. I've been waiting a long time <laughs> to finally get it up there. Now the oldest person to ever go to space, joined by the youngest, 18-year-old Oliver. Among the memorabilia on board, Amelia Earhart's aviator goggles. Looking down at the Earth's atmosphere, says Bezos, makes climate change very real. Criticized for spending billions on a space tourism business, Bezos is now facing backlash for this comment. I want to thank... Uh, 
every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer because you guys paid for all of this. He announced earlier today, used the spotlight to announce a new uh, philanthropic a new initiative, philanthropic giving away $200 million for yeah, charities. Meanwhile, out. Bezos announced $100 million in ticket sales for future flights, each ticket reportedly costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. You've got to do it the same way we did it with commercial airline travel. Starting with biplanes, he says, and growing to modern day passenger jets. So, will he fly again? Hell yes. <laughs> How fast can you refuel that thing? Let's go. And that is all from us here at World News. Join Susan Ginali tomorrow with a new edition. Until then, stay safe and protect your loved ones. I'm Danny Zanwasan. Have a great night.